day. Um, today's micro learning is on the power of sleep. 10 tips to help you get a better night's sleep um, with Morgan Adams. Um, before we start in the chat, please enter your name. Uh, if you'd like your company, if you would want, if you want to connect with others, your LinkedIn profile. Um, and for those who are in the live Zoom audience, if you're comfortable, turn on your videos because we love seeing your beautiful faces. And I know as a speaker, it helps me. For those who are watching this via live stream on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Facebook, um, we want you interacting and in this conversation as well. So in the comments or the chat, um, introduce yourself as well, your name, what city you're coming from, um, and if you want to connect with others, your LinkedIn prof profile. Um, and also, if you have advice to share or if something that Morgan or anyone else on the call um, resonates with you, let us know in the chat and in the comments. Um, so as a, as a reminder, our community of seven micro learnings help our listeners elevate their mindset and skill set by bringing in leading authors, thought leaders, coaches, executives. Um, our goal is to train a million people and our micro learnings are training and development pieces that are bite sized pieces um, and small learning units with just the right amount of information to help you achieve your goals. This is not a webinar where you passively listen. We want you in the conversation. Um, and we want you to immediately take one, two, three actions within 24 hours. Our goal is to democratize leadership development for all. That's why we make these micro learnings free and open to the public. And we just launched our YouTube channel. So please join that um, if you have a chance. Um, and I also wanna thank the community of seven core members and supporter members who make these talks possible. If you're interested in becoming a supporter member, it's just $99 a year. For those who are in the live Zoom audience, if you can, once again, turn on your videos. Um, and for the next section, if you can, if you're in the live Zoom audience, um, put this in gallery mode. And if you can, turn on your videos. Um, and we're gonna do a short quiz. Raise both hands like this if the answer is yes. And if you're watching this on live stream, just type in yes or no. Um, and if the answer is no, don't raise your hands. How many of you have ever dozed off while sitting and or reading or watching TV? How many of you have dozed off while sitting in a public place? Um, how many of you have fell asleep while driving. I'm sure not a full sleep, but accidentally dozed off. Um, how many of you can fall asleep, but wake up in the middle of the night and have trouble getting back to sleep? How many of you feel like you don't get enough sleep? Okay, thank you everyone. So top right hand side, put this in speaker mode so you should just see me. Um, Today's topic is micro learning is on the power of sleep, 10 tips to help you get a better night's sleep. This talk is so important. Um, I gather that it can possibly save your life, your marriage, friendship, sanity, um, because without sleep, we as humans die. I never appreciated sleep when I was younger. I remember when I was in college, we would do all-nighters at least once or twice a week. We would actually go, so I was going to Stanford University for undergrad, and we would go to the local Denny's because it was 24 hours, and we would literally do an all-nighter at least once or twice a week, right? Um, and when I got older, I realized that I couldn't function without it. In fact, one in three adults in the United States report not getting enough rest every day, one in three. And nearly 40% of adults report falling asleep during the day at work or at home at least once a month. So funny story. I remember when I was pregnant with my, my daughter, my daughter's name is Morgan too, um, with my daughter. And I just remember being so tired 
that I felt I had this little ottoman in my office and um, where I put all my shoes and I literally fell asleep for like two hours. I closed my office door and I fell asleep for two hours because I was so tired. Um, and I think about like hustle culture, right? Um, you know, I'm sure many of you guys have said this or heard a friend say this, but I'll sleep when I die, right? How many of you have caught yourself saying that before? I know when I was younger, I had that mentality. Um, here's the thing, not sleeping can actually lead to you dying. <laughs> so sleep deficiency can lead to physical, mental health issues, injuries, loss of productivity, weight gain, and the likelihood of death. So in the chat or, uh, or comment section, if you're watching this on live stream in the comment section, I want you to answer the following, okay? Um, oh, first question, tell me in the chat, but don't press send till I tell you, how many hours of sleep are you currently getting a night? Uh, let me know in the chat. I'm going to count down five, four, three, two, one, send. Six to seven hours, seven hours, five hours, six hours. And I'm looking at the uh, live stream as well. I'm getting five, six, seven. I don't really see many eights, which is kind of interesting. Five, not enough. Anne is saying not enough, right? Um, thank you so much. And I want you to answer this next question in the chat. What's keeping you from sleeping enough? What's keeping you from sleeping enough? Five, four, three, two, one, press send. Tired but wired. Um, stress, overthinking, a lot of stress, wanting to spend time with your child, no idea. I wake up to, uh, too much. Phone, ruminating thoughts, uh, um, social media. I think Kathy, how do you pronounce that? T t uh, t tonight? I think it's with the ear, right? Like, okay, yes. So like kind of health issues, um, yeah. social media. Okay, I see a lot of common traits. Do you guys see the through line with that? Um, so, so excited, drum roll, to introduce Morgan Adam. Let me spotlight her right now. Give me one second. Awesome. So Morgan Adams is a holistic sleep coach helping adults who struggle with getting a good night's sleep. Her goal is to help people feel better and live better. And she believes that the key is by getting a good night's sleep. She's a former insomniac who spent almost a decade using prescription sleeping pills despite knowing that her overall sleep quality suffered. She's also a two-time breast cancer survivor who advocates for lifestyle um, of disease prevention and integrated holistic strategies for cancer treatment. Um, so Morgan, welcome. First question, and I'm going to um, maybe get offline after this because I need to recharge my computer. Uh, first question is what are the benefits of sleep? There are so many. There's not like one aspect of our life that sleep is not touched. So let's just start with the physical aspects of getting good sleep. So when we're getting good sleep, we are getting really a good brain cleansing. So when we're in our deep sleep phase, we have um, a cleansing that happens in our brain, which is pretty amazing. We have a glymphatic system. We've all heard of the lymphatic system. Well, there's a glymphatic system that was re recently discovered not that long ago so you're cleansing your brain in the best way possible at night. Um, with your cardiovascular health, you're getting benefits with that. You are helping to regulate your hunger and sex hormones. With mental health, there are also a lot of other benefits, emotional and stress regulation. Learning and memory is increased when you have really good sleep. And one thing that is not talked about enough that I want to shine a light on is how it affects our social life and our interpersonal life. When you are getting good sleep, you are more apt to have empathy, the ability to relate well with others, and you're more willing to solve conflict. So it really good sleep encompasses all, 
all aspects of our health and our life. And so what are some of the things that we can do proactively, maybe with our environment, et cetera, to get more sleep or yes. better sleep? Yes. So we really want to pay attention to our bedroom environment. And the, and the way I like to describe this to, to folks is think of your bedroom as a cave, okay? Caves are cool, dark, and quiet. So with the cool aspect, you're, you're looking at probably the best temperature around mid, mid 60s. Um, when your body is cool, you are better able to fall asleep and maintain sleep. So lowering your thermostat is a great idea for that. And then with the quiet aspect, you wanna make sure that you have eliminated any potential um, noise distractions. Um, a lot of times people will use earplugs, um, especially when they travel, because you can't control what's around you in your hotel and, and Airbnb. And also um, a white noise machine is really helpful. I have one in my bedroom. And if you travel and want the white noise, you, there are many, many apps you can use for that. And then the dark aspect, we really know uh, through recent studies that when we, we sleep in a pitch dark environment, it's better for our metabolic and cardiovascular health. So we want to make sure that we have really basically the, the room so dark that if you held your hand up like this, you really couldn't see your hand because it's so dark in the room. So ways to achieve that would be to invest in blackout curtains or shades. Or if you, um, these days they have portable ones, so you can buy them and travel with them, which is genius. I like to travel with a, um, a pair, like an eye mask that I wear when I'm sleeping, because again, when, when you're in a hotel or an Airbnb, you sometimes don't know the situation with the blind. So you get, you have that extra protection. Um, so those are really sort of the, the basics about how to keep your bedroom in a, in a way that is suitable for sleeping. And um, in the comments, I, a few people kind of mentioned screen time, social media as being a kind of deterrent. How important is it to not have, you know, I've heard people recommend not having a TV or your cell phone in your bedroom. Do you prescribe to that or what, what is your recommendation? Yeah, that's an interesting topic. Um, so my take on the phone in the bedroom while you're sleeping is I think you should just have it out of the bedroom completely. And a lot of people try to kind of fight me on this when I'm working with them because a lot of people use their phones as an alarm. Okay. But there's an easy solution before phones. What do we use? We used an alarm clock. So getting just a regular alarm clock or maybe one of the alarm clocks that has like a, a daytime simulator that gradually um, produces light so that that wakes you up instead of a jarring alarm sound. Um, also, if your phone is by your bed, even if it's on airplane mode, you still have that EMF problem, the um, electromagnetic frequency issue. You don't want that around your sleeping environment. Um, also, one of the downsides of having the phone at arm's reach in bed is that if you do wake up at 2 or 3 a.m., what do a lot of people like to do? They like to placate themselves and try to get back to sleep by scrolling. And that is, the, it's going to have the opposite effect because if you're sitting there with your phone in your hand, you've got the blue light shining on you and that's going to impede your melatonin. So um, I really do strongly recommend that people just put their phone in another room. If they, if they absolutely hundred percent need the phone for an alarm, they could maybe put it in a closet or in a, a bedroom nearby or a bathroom nearby so that they can hear the alarm. Um, as far as TVs, I also don't really recommend having a TV in the bedroom. Um, if you, and I know that sometimes like with um, partners, there's, you know, there's a difference of opinion often. And one partner wants the bedroom, wants the TV in the bedroom and the other doesn't. But if you um, must have a TV in your bedroom and you are watching it at night, I would definitely recommend that you have a timer set so that it goes off at a certain point in time. Because what they have shown recently is that the, the light um, from the TV is not good for your metabolic health, nor is the sound. The sound can wake you up and really disturb your sleep. And the TV, the TV topic is an interesting one because a lot of people have, have found out, just I'm very open about it. I watch TV at night as part of my wind down routine. 
And I, so I don't, I don't tell people don't watch TV at night at all, because there is, is actually a way you can watch TV at night without it impacting your sleep. And so I'll share the, the tips for people for that. Um, you want to watch TV on a regular TV, like an old fashioned TV, not, you don't want to have your laptop like this, looking at, looking at it. Um, so you want to be fairly far away from the TV and you want to make sure that you are choosing content that is not arousing, controversial, scary. Like you really want to have content that's kind of vanilla. You know, um, some of the things that I find like are really pleasurable to watch and not upsetting or controversial would be like food shows or like Ted Lasso is a so great show. No true crime. No, none of that. <laughs> Which is what I normally that. watch at night for some reason. Yeah, I, I, I really, I've personally found that shows like that do keep me up or I'm just like r- ruminating on the bad things that happen. Um, so, you know, you don't have to like abandon TV watching at night by any stretch. In fact, I was looking at um, a recent survey, Sleep Foundation, they did a poll of people's top bedtime r- rituals and 52% p- of people watch TV before bed. So it's a really, really common activity, but we just need to be really mindful of like, how we're approaching our TV watching. And one other thing about the TV watching is we can get really, really hooked into the Netflix, the autoplay. So I, if you're going to watch a show, disable the autoplay, set a curfew as to like when you're going to stop watching TV, because you could just go on and on and on. Um, it's it's quite addictive that Netflix. No, and also I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the whole issue with screen time too, because like the whole algorithms they make it so addictive with the autoplay, where you know you're like, oh, I'll just watch this, and then you know we'll watch this next episode, yes. and it's just like kind of interrelated, and they actually yes. make it so it's sticky and addictive. They know what um, they're doing. <laughs> yeah, uh, Bridget uh, in the comments has uh, you know all TV timers uh, have it. Uh, ability to shut the TV off, TV off at a specific time. So that might, that's a good idea. Great idea. And then Marie Fahi has a question, um, I guess, related to the screens as well. Um, so she's read a lot of responses about blue light exposure from your phone. And I know sometimes people wear those glass, blue, yes. uh, those the blue glasses. light blocking glasses. Exactly. Yes. What's your take on that? Yes. So I am wearing a pair of blue light blocking glasses. These have like um, very, very light yellow, but they make them in different um, tints, different styles. Um, at night when I am watching TV, I forgot to mention this, I am wearing the dark red shades. And so there is a little bit of controversy about how well the blue light blocking glasses work. Some people claim it works really well for them. Some people don't seem to be as affected, but I find that they make me sleepy if I'm wearing them for over half an hour. And I, in my, in my opinion, I feel like it's a, it's a good safety measure in case you are getting exposed to too much blue light. And it's not, and it's not always the blue light at night. That is a problem. Um, We tend to like hone in so much on the blue light, but we need to also remember that there are other like lighting fixtures in our house that can be really bright, like the bright led um, overhead lights. Those can be a culprit and, um, and messing up with our, messing up our melatonin production. So we really need to be mindful about the whole light environment and like dimming those overhead lights or shutting them off, putting on, um, clicking on like a dim table light instead of the bright lights. So we just want to be careful. And if we are on our phone or our computer, because maybe we have to work, they have um, a lot of light filtering um, types of settings on, on, computers and phones that you can can adjust the light to make the light a little bit warmer and a little bit dimmer. So I would suggest that as well. So do you wear your blue blockers all day or only like after a certain period of time? Well, these these are actually designed for daytime use. They're, they block a little bit of blue light um, and they're really good for eye strain. So they're, uh, they're these are kind of called circadian um, rhythm glasses, circadian therapy glasses. Um, the orange ones I wear after dinner. So like in the early evening. And then when I watch TV eight ish, that's when the red ones go on. Mm. So So you do this every day, every day. Yeah. And, uh, 
I mean, I even went as far as, I mean, this is kind of how like obsessed I am about my, my own personal belief about how it works for me and everyone is different. So I suggest that everyone, you know, experiment. But when I was in the hospital getting my mastectomy a year and a half ago, I was a, very well aware how those bright hospital lights mm-hmm. are. So I packed along with me a pair of the blue blocking glasses and put them on while I was in the recovery room and like, you know, getting, getting ready to go home because I knew like, I didn't want to be kept up awake at night. Cause those, I mean, those hospital lights are very, very bright. Um, so I will take them to the airport. Um, you know, I mean, if I, if I have people over at night and it's getting late, I'll put them on. They know me well enough to know I'm, I'm not that weird, but <laughs> <laughs> a little weird, but not over the top. So tell me a little bit about your kind of history, because you mean how you became a sleep coach, but also the fact that you had sleep issues for almost a decade and were and was taking medication. Yes. What made what was your aha moment to stop the medication and become a sleep coach? And what is a sleep coach? Yes. Oh, good questions. So uh, it was several years ago that I had an, um, a bout of insomnia and that bout lasted eight years. I didn't really know what to do about it. Um, And I ended up taking sleeping pills for eight years. And the consequences of the sleeping pills for me really were not good in the daytime. I was very groggy. Um, I didn't really become fully awake till lunch. And, um, you know, it started to impact my work. I had a, I had a job where I had to be kind of like on the spot to respond to crises by writing a press release or whatever. And there were times when something would go down at work and I just was frozen on the screen. Like I couldn't type. I just like, my mind was just mush. Um, I would have like binge eating episodes that I didn't recall. So there were just a lot of consequences with the sleeping pills. Um, but I just didn't know of any other way out. And then eight years into that, uh, sleeping pill, um, dependence, I met my current husband who was then a new boyfriend. And he said to me just, you know, out of love, like, Hey, when you take these pills, you kind of act like a zombie and it's freaking me out. And that was really my wake up call to, to make a change. And so I did what I don't recommend people do. I took myself off of the pills. It was very hard to do. So for anyone listening who is on sleeping pills and who wants to get off of them, I really strongly suggest that you go to your prescribing provider who should be able to provide some kind of a tapering off schedule for you, um, because it really should be done with supervision. In addition, I would also work with a sleep coach because the sleep coach will give you that accountability and support as you're going off the sleeping pills. Cause the doctor is probably not going to have the bandwidth to like, hold your hand through it. Um, so because of, I mean, I obviously had a very, very difficult time with insomnia. I, I got better. I was able to get off the sleeping pills. And I slept fine for quite a few years. And then in March of 2020, when the pandemic hit, I started to have sleep issues again. And I got really concerned because I did not want to go back to full-blown insomnia. So I started to really research uh, sleep and I bought myself an aura ring to track my sleep. And I was able to get things back on an even keel. And I, I was so excited about the turnaround that I had that I started to share just organically on Facebook, things I was doing to improve my sleep when when the pandemic hit. And I came to find out that a lot of people in my social circle were struggling as well during this time. And I thought, this is this is really interesting. And I got I got, you know, probably toward the end of 2020, I just had a revelation that I needed to help people with their sleep. And I was like, I'm going to become a sleep coach. Well, okay, great. Well, that's a really, you know, valiant, <laughs> valiant kind of idea. But at the time, you know, there's, there, there's not a lot of training for sleep coaches. There are some programs some certifications. What I did was I got a health coaching certification because I wanted a general, um, you know, overview kind of just a training for health and, and the coaching part as well. And then I took several different, um, more specific sleep science certification um, uh, courses to kind of round out what I learned in um, health coaching school. And 
a lot of times people are like, what the heck is a sleep coach? Like, it's so strange. Like, it's a kind of a new area of expertise. And the easiest way to describe it is really like a personal trainer for sleep, the way somebody has a personal trainer for their fitness. So the sleep coach is there to provide um, support and accountability because a lot of times what people are needing to do is make the behavioral changes, you know, putting the phone away before you go to bed, um, you know, stopping the caffeine, stopping the alcohol too close to bed. So um, there, the sleep coach is there to walk you through that, devise a plan, devise a morning and evening routine suitable for you. Um, there's so many things a sleep coach can do, but that's kind of that's kind of how I do it. I have um, more of a holistic approach, you know, so that I can help people either get off the sleeping pills with the help of their doctor or prevent them from actually having to go on a medication because most people don't really want to do that. They really would like to use holistic methods to, to help their sleep. Yeah. And there's a few comments about like people wanting to kind of use um, drugs as a sleeping aids as, as a last resort. Um, so you mentioned like a uh, trackers, so, or yes. I have a aura ring as well. Okay. Um, what's interesting, you know, and I've, from talking to friends, I don't know the science behind it, but, um, the, the issue with like sleeping aids, sleeping pills is that you might be getting superficial sleep, but you might, might not be getting REM or deep sleep, which is the sleep you need to repair and heal. And so that was like a big aha for me because at the beginning of the pandemic as well, um, I got I got into a depressive state and I was sleeping 14, 15 an hours, but I would wake up feeling just really groggy and tired. And um, I didn't have the tracker at that time, but I would think, I, I, my belief is I didn't get a lot of deep sleep, mm. right? It was very restless. like. I would wake up in the middle of the night and then I would scroll because this is at the height of COVID and I would just be reading about people dying and I would just get into these fear states and I would sleep, wake up, sleep, wake up. It wasn't good sleep. Are trackers valuable and would you recommend it to the folks who are on this call? Yeah, I, I, I find uh, trackers like this. Um, the Aura, there's the Whoop, there's the Fitbit, there's there's Apple. They there are several different wearable sleep trackers on the market, and I find that generally speaking, they are very useful for most people, and they're the, they're most useful for people who are able to look at their data and make behavioral changes accordingly. So, for example, I'll use myself. If I have alcohol, I can clearly see that my deep sleep suffers, my recovery scores suffer. And that actually for me is motivating enough to either not have alcohol or reduce it significantly. So if you're the kind of person who can look at the data and you're able to make the connection and change your behavior, I think it's an excellent tool. Um, I would like to say though, that people can get a little overboard sometimes with the obsession about the trackers, especially when they're looking at their sleep staging, which is looking at the REM and the deep sleep staging. The sleep trackers are no notoriously in inaccurate for tracking the deep and REM phases. They're about 50 to, 50 to 60% accurate. So we really don't know for sure, you know, by looking at our tracker, the, the amount of deep and REM we're getting. However, Aura has improved their algorithm to make it a lot more accurate. I am an affiliate with Aura, so I am I, I am a little biased and I will I do talk about it a little bit more, but I, I applaud them for updating the algorithm to reflect the more accurate stages of our sleep. And one more thing I'll say about sleep trackers is that with my clients who typically are mostly people with insomnia and those folks tend to have a lot of anxiety about their sleep, a lot of worry and rumination. And a lot of those folks don't do well with a sleep tracker. So I really, I kind of carefully screen my clients who don't have a sleep tracker and are thinking about getting one because I'm able to kind of tell their, with their personality and they, they if they know themselves, they're able to um, determine whether or not looking at the data will make them even more anxious about their sleep. Because really the bottom line is that we want to 
focus in on how we feel physically and mentally about our sleep versus what the tracker tells us. Because we know from studies that sometimes a tracker will say we didn't have a good night of sleep. Um, and we actually did. And then we start kind of doubting our doubting ourselves, like, well, maybe I shouldn't be feeling as good if my sleep tracker said. So it, just, it, it can mess with your head if you don't look at it appropriately. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I was kind of going through that too, where I was trying to optimize too much, but at the end of the day, it was getting me more stressed, which made it harder for me to fall asleep. Right. Like yes. I would wake up in the middle of the night. I'm like, Oh no, I'm impacting my deep sleep. <laughs> yes. That, that's a, that's case in point. That's exactly the downside of it. So you, you really have to, I think, know yourself and know your triggers and know your personality to, to see if you're a good fit for a sleep tracker. Yeah. For, for those on, uh, on the call that aren't familiar, there's different stages of sleep, REM sleep, deep sleep, light sleep, et cetera. But um, little nuances, like what, when you go to sleep impact, because you want to kind of get into deep sleep. And if you go to sleep past your window and if it's too late, sometimes it's harder to fall asleep or you just have light sleep. Um, and for cases of like, I think about my mom uh, who has dementia, um, she's in a constant even though she's sleeping all day she has a lot of light sleep so she's not getting that enough sleep to repair her brain mm -hmm. there's little things that you you know um as you research it a little bit more that might be beyond this call um, if this is something that you're really interested i would recommend researching the different stages of sleep and how it impacts you and your health because it when you if you have cancer if you have health issues getting enough sleep is so important so I have a few comments here and you kind of mentioned the whole caffeine issue because I'm a <laughs> caffeine addict. Um, and, you know, um, Bridget Trusty in the comments is scaring me because she says caffeine takes about 12 hours to leave your system. Um, and her True. question is, is it safer to just have a cup in the morning by bedtime? The caffeine is gone. So any recommendations on caffeine? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that the up. Other drug. <laughs> the other drug. It's the other drug. It's the most used drug in the world, caffeine. And I did have my cup of coffee this morning. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that we need, most of us need to give up caffeine to have good sleep, but we need to really be careful about when we cut ourselves off. I call it a caffeine curfew. And so generally speaking, I would recommend that most people cut off their caffeine by around noon um, because it does stay in your system for a, quite a while, about, you know, 10 hours or so. And, um, you know, I will see people from time to time who will have coffee after dinner and they are like, it doesn't impact my sleep and they get to sleep fine. But if you were to measure um, with a polysomnography, you would see that their deep sleep does get impacted they do get fragmented sleep um, and they don't really, they don't realize it. And they, they wake up tired the next morning only to have even more caffeine. So it becomes a very vicious cycle over time. So I would recommend noon being the cutoff. And also we do know that some people's genetics respond to caffeine differently. Some people clear caffeine more quickly than others. Um, so I usually err on the side of caution with my clients and recommend that they cut themselves off around noon. Wow. As Cheers. you can see, I still have my <laughs> cup of coffee. Well, it's, you're, 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 you're almost there. You're, you're just past the curve. <laughs> <laughs> Switch to decaf. Yeah. Um, so Will Sullivan in the comments has a question about melatonin. Does melatonin yeah. work? What's your opinion on melatonin? So melatonin, um, has, you know, a little bit of a controversy. Um, there isn't a whole lot of data showing that it's super helpful for sleep or insomnia. Uh, what I read is that it helps you get to sleep maybe seven minutes quicker, and you might get eight, eight minutes more of sleep a night, which is really not anything to write home about. Where it is most effective and useful is for jet lag or circadian rhythm disorders. And there's different schedules that you can follow for that that are way too in depth for this conversation. But um, a lot of people use melatonin um, because it's so readily available and it's relatively safe um, as a hormone to take. However, people need to be very careful about the source of the melatonin that they get. And so what they did a few years ago is they, they had a study where they pulled random bottles of 
melatonin off the shelves. And what they found was that there was probably 70% of the bottles had a wide variance in terms of how much was in the bottle versus how much was advertised on the, on the, on the label. So you could get much less or a lot more. And if you got, you know, a three milligram, you know, three milligrams of melatonin or five milligrams, and it had a lot more, you could potentially be getting too much melatonin and having grogginess in the morning, because that's one of the side effects of too much melatonin is being groggy in the morning. Um, so if people do want to use melatonin for sleep, I would recommend that they look at brands that are USP certified and USP basically means that they have been tested so that the amount of uh, melatonin in the bottle matches what is advertised. So it's really a buyer beware situation out there with melatonin. Um, what I'm finding is that just in a general store or, or um, you know, uh, grocery store or whatever, the, the amount of melatonin is, is quite high. Like they're selling three and five, really you're, you want to dose a lot lower than that. You know, how about melatonin for kids? Um, that, that's a really controversial topic as well. And the experts that I look to don't recommend that the sleep doctors do not recommend that because it is a hormone. However, I believe in certain cases where maybe there's autism, I think it might be used in specific situations, but I don't think the average child should really be getting a hormone, be getting melatonin because it is a hormone. So I would, I would proceed with caution about that. Awesome. Um, we had some questions. Denise Heyman, do you want to unmute and ask your question? You had a great question um, in the uh, chat. Oh, the one about exercise? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering if daily exercise, if you think daily exercise helps. I mean, I exercise a lot for other reasons, um, but I, I do think it helps, but I'm, I'd love to hear your opinion. It absolutely helps. It, and studies show it. It helps with um, how fast it takes to get to sleep, our sleep efficiency, our sleep quality. Um, I read a, or heard a Matthew Walker podcast recently. He's a really well-known sleep scientist. He did a series all about exercise and he talked about a study where they were looking at older adults and they were looking at whether um, aerobic or weight training uh, was, was better for sleep. And in this particular study on older adults, they showed that aerobic activity was more helpful for their sleep. They also showed that moderate aerobic activity was more helpful than high intense. So a lot of times we think, oh, more is better. Like let's go hard at this exercise. It might help us sleep better. That's not always the case. And it, especially as we get older. So I definitely recommend for my clients to have some amount of activity, physical activity every day. And I think one of the best things that we can do really for our sleep health is take outdoor walks especially in the morning, because you're really kind of habit stacking, you're able to like, get your exercise in as well as that sunlight exposure in the morning, which is so critical to regulate and strengthen your circadian rhythm. So yeah, I'm a huge proponent of exercise for sleep health. Absolutely. So I've read a lot about the importance of getting like that early morning sunlight as soon as you wake up. Yes. Um, you know, why is that important? And what do we, how about for people who are in the Northeast who you're not getting sunlight, Yeah, <laughs> you know, for four or five uh, yeah. you know, months in the year? Yeah. So the reason why it's really important to get sunlight as soon as you can is because when you're, you're when the sun hits your retina, it sends a signal to your suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is your circadian pacemaker. And that's, that basically sets a, a, a cascade of hormones and neurotransmitter balance. So it like shuts off any remaining melatonin left over from the night before. It boosts your cortisol to give you energy. It boosts your serotonin to prepare you for the following night as far as like melatonin production. So it's, it's a very beautiful symphony of neurotransmitter and hormone release that you can only get with the sunlight. Okay, so in the example that you shared, about people who live in the Northeast and areas where there's just not a lot of sun, um, a substitution, not a direct substitution, but sort of a second best type of thing would be a, um, what they call a sad light or a light box. So they, they're 
quite inexpensive. I have one literally sitting above me to like shine light on me. Otherwise I'd take it down and show you, but they're about this big. And you want one that is 10 lux that provides enough light. So what you do is you just sit in front of it for about 20 minutes in the morning. Maybe you could have it in front of you while you eat breakfast. You could have it um, in the bathroom while you're getting ready for work. Um, so it's a good substitute, but it's not quite the amount of bright can, can light. Can you repeat what that light is called? And can you just buy it on Amazon or yes. at the store? So things you would want to Google, happy light or SAD lights. SAD stands for seasonal affective disorder. Mm -hmm. So it's often used for treatment of seasonal, defect, seasonal affective disorder. That's amazing yeah. that how important just sunlight or just getting walking out in nature. Is so like can yes. be such a boost. Yes. Um, so Sharon King says, I moved from California to Virginia and my vitamin D levels are super low and my sleep went to crap. Um, and it's been 10 years. Oh my gosh. Um, so yeah, so um, so in lines with that, like taking vitamins, Kathy, you have a great question. Do you want to unmute and ask your question as well? Uh, about the valerian? Yes. I I totally agree on the melatonin. And I think it's it's the wild, wild west. And it is buyer beware. And it concerns me. But what about herbals? Or is it the same scenario of really, you really have to be careful? I don't think the issue is quite as severe with the herbals, um, the, the valerian. I would say, though, that whatever supplement or vitamin you're using is to get it from a reputable source. You know, I, I, I'm you know, if you have a, a practitioner who has an online dispensary, um, I recommend doing that because sometimes you just don't know the quality. Like for example, Costco and Sam's, I'm just not sure of the quality of their supplements. I, I personally wouldn't use that um, because we don't know, but I don't, as far as like something as benign as val valerian root or, you know, something herbal like that, it's probably not a, a huge problem. Um, but yeah, we need to be smart shoppers with supplements for sure. So you talk to a lot of different clients that are having like sleep issues for various reasons. What are some of the bad habits that are the main culprits that, that Ooh, are impacting yes. your sleep? Because I think it's helpful to kind of learn what yes. to do, but also what not to do. Yes. So one of the biggest bad habits that I see, and we kind of touched on it earlier, is scrolling social media at night. A lot of people will have their phone by their bed, um, scroll TikTok, Instagram. I mean, it, 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 you just go down the rabbit hole when you do that. So I recommend that people just put their phone away at night, you know, maybe an hour before they go to bed so that they're not tempted. Um, another thing that I see people doing quite a bit is having very inconsistent sleep and wake times. We really want to make sure that we're as consistent as possible, especially with our wake time. That is like one of the best sleep tips ever is to get to have that regularity in your wake time. And that means even on the weekends, people are like, what? I can't sleep in. So what ends up happening, like, for example, if you were to get up at 6 a.m. every morning for work, Monday through Friday, and then you go out Friday and Saturday till midnight, you might sleep in till nine. That gives you like a three hour differential. What you're essentially doing is you're giving yourself social jet lag, which is feels like jet lag, but you haven't traveled anywhere. So really, I mean, if you if you are out late on the weekend, it's okay to probably sleep in maybe like a half an hour or so, but you're really getting in that kind of danger zone when you're going like two hours, three hours, because it your body and your brain with sleep crave consistency. The more consistent you can be, um, the better your body will respond and your sleep will just become a lot more solid. Um, and the, with as far as like at night, people sometimes get a little bit too um, dogmatic about like an exact bedtime. Like my bedtime is at nine or my bedtime is at 10. I really recommend that, that you give yourself a window like an, of an hour to go to bed, because if you give yourself like a nine o'clock bedtime, you may not be sleepy until 9.30 one night. And if you get into bed at nine and you're 
hardly sleepy at all, you might end up becoming really frustrated. And you definitely don't want that. So if you are going to bed, excuse me, if you are getting up regularly at a certain time every morning, the chances of being sleepy 16 hours later are going to be greater because you've got that anchored morning wake up time. So the consistency is really important. I don't think a lot of people realize that because I have clients, when I work with clients, we do a sleep journal Mm -hmm. and I'll see lots of variants within like their sleep and wake time. So we really, really work hard on making things a little bit tighter. Um, So what do we do? I, you know, I feel like there's so much going on in the world right now between layoffs, bank crashes, the economy, you name it. How, like, how has stressing anxiety impacted sleep? And then what what can we do to mitigate it? Because it's it's kind of a vicious cycle because, you know, you're, you're stressed, you don't sleep. And because you don't sleep, your stress and anxiety gets worse. I know for me, when I don't get enough sleep, it, the, the, it toggles between depression and sadness and it's, it's like a vicious cycle. Yes. How do you get yourself outside yeah. of that loop? Yeah. This is like one of the most common things that I work on with my clients because most sleep problems I think are rooted in anxiety and stress. And so we really, really need to address that. One of the things that I like to um, teach people is, is a really um, accessible exercise. It's called the constructive worry exercise. So this is really good for you if you um, get into bed and start to have all of these things pop into your mind, your brain is racing with like, what about this? What about that? The worries, the concerns of the day. So what you do for this exercise is probably around dinner time. Most, most of my clients like to do this after dinner in the early evening is you take a sheet of paper, you draw a line down the center of the paper on the left-hand side column, you write worries and concerns. On the right-hand side column, you write solutions. And you basically just brain dump for about 20 minutes, you know, writing down a worry and then the next step that you can take to solve that worry or concern. And sometimes there is no solution. For example, you know, a world crisis, layoffs, you're not going to be able to like solve that in one one fell swoop. So you might just write, um, we'll have to revisit, no answer for this. And then what you're doing with this exercise is you're getting all of this stuff out of your head onto paper so that when you wake up at night or when you're trying to fall asleep, you can tell yourself if the worries start to creep back up, hey, I've dealt with my worries for the day. I've had my worry time and I'm going to resume worrying tomorrow. So it's very structured. Another thing that I like to encourage people to do is to practice mindfulness and a lot of times that mindfulness will come to my, come to mind as evening meditation like before meditation before bed meditation which is great but i really encourage people to start mindfulness from the second they wake up and to take what i call mindfulness snacks throughout the day so take take some breaks take take a walk outside without any technology um you know, take a break and meditate, take a break uh, and do some breath work. So kind of like plug these little mindfulness snacks in throughout your day. I'm telling you, even, even using like, no matter how busy you are, you have to go to the bathroom several times a day. So if you are super busy and you use the bathroom, use that one minute to do some deep breaths or to just take a pause because we really, really need to, to take that break and practice some mindfulness so that we can mitigate those stresses throughout the day. So they don't, don't accumulate over the, over the day and then spill into the evening. Yeah. One of my favorite books is um, by BJ Fogg. He is a scientist at Stanford, but he talks about tiny habits. Yes. And so one of the things he recommended was tying something that you do like brushing your teeth, going to the bathroom and then tying it with a good habit, right? So it's something that you do regularly, or for example, for me, as soon as I wake up or when I go to sleep, I have like, I, in my mind, run through 10 things I'm grateful for, what I have, you know, like, so it forces me to do this on a regular break basis, like brushing your teeth, right? So you kind of connect something that you do regularly with a good habit. 
So I, I like that that, um, that habit of going to the bathroom and meditating or breathing or, or whatnot. Yeah. Um, I think breathing is so important and we don't think about it because yeah. we just kind of take it for granted, yeah. but it's so important for just our living, right? You can't, can't yes. live with that if we don't breathe. Yeah. Um, Kathy in the comments says, um, you know, about the stress and all this other stuff that everything that, that I just described used to occur over weeks, but months, but now they occur literally daily. Right. And I don't know if that's necessarily the case though, Kathy, I think these things were always happening. It's just now we have social media. Now we have 24 hour news. So these bad things in the world were always happening. Right. We just didn't hear about what was happening in Ukraine or whatnot. We kind of would read about it. But now it's like we get notifications and pings and texts and it's like constant barrage of negative news. Right. And what sells is negative news. So you get more of it. But I think you hit a really good point, Morgan, which is write down the things that you can control and what you can't control. If you can't control it, having it in here is not going to help the world. I am not going to cure cancer or hunger by worrying about it in here. But I have control over what I eat, what my, you know, what chemicals are in my house, right? Focus on the things you could focus on the controllables. Because when you focus on things that are not in your domain of control, you are just basically setting yourself up for more stress and yes. angst, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, just to, to piggyback on that, I mean, you're right. There is so much, there's so much opportunity for us to get stressed by what we see on the news. And, you know, I like to, you know, urge people to take like a news or news media hiatus, you know, you don't need to check in every three hours. There's, there's no need for that. Um, so really like managing your, your, your news consumption, I think can be very, very helpful because it's all around us. They, the headlines are triggered to make you scared, anxious, and that's not what we're looking for. I love that. And so kind of leaving this on a positive note, what are some of the things that we can do like in terms of a nighttime routine or what can we do? What are the proactive things we can do today, starting now that is, that's going to set us up for success? Yeah. So there are, just to recap, because we've already kind of gone over some of these things, but um, the waking and and being exposed to the sun every morning is really one of the number one exercise daily, a very important tip, um, the regularity of the wake ups and trying to get to bed, you know, within a consistent um, time frame, uh, trying to keep a, a caffeine curfew, an alcohol curfew, we really didn't talk too much about that, but really trying to um, make sure that you're giving yourself an alcohol alcohol curfew as well of at least three hours. And um, same thing with dinner. We really want to make sure that we give our our bodies time to digest because if we go to bed with a full stomach, it's going to prioritize digestion over sleep. So if you can try to be more mindful about when you eat dinner, that can be very helpful because um, a lot of people are eating really too late. So um those are some, those are some tips. i um, trying to think of some more. Um, How important is diet and what we oh, eat? Oh yeah, that's a good one. Thank you for bringing that up. So um, there's no like magic food or anything like that. If there were, we'd, we'd know by now, but what data has shown um, is that a diet that is primarily a Mediterranean style diet seems to be very sleep conducive to a lot of people. Um, a lot of it is because there's um fruits and vegetables in it. There's omega-3 fatty acids. So if you like Mediterranean food, that's great. Eat more of that. Fatty fish, uh, legumes, nuts, seeds, um, kiwi, tart cherries are all foods that have been shown in some studies to be sleep promoting. Um, but again, you really, I think the timing of our, our food intake is extremely important. And just, I mentioned with the eating dinner, trying to give yourself that three hour buffer between dinner and going to bed and trying not to snack. That can be a big source. Like a lot of people will have like cookies and ice cream right before bed that wrecks your deep sleep and it makes you too hot. So you do have those awakenings at night. Another thing that I'll share about um, sleep and food is 
we really want to make sure that we start our day and continue our, our day with good blood sugar balance. So when you're thinking about breakfast, you want to think about something that's got a fair amount of protein and fat and a little bit of carb, but not, you don't want to just have a breakfast of straight up pancakes because that's just that what we call naked carbs that really, really spikes your glucose and your blood glucose is like this all day. You want a, a nicer level. So really when you're thinking about meals, prioritizing protein, having some fat, having some complex carbs, minimizing sugar. So those are, those are some basics about how to balance blood sugar. But we, we find that when our blood sugar is balanced throughout the day, um, it does help our sleep at night. I love that. Um, well, I think we have time for one more question. Patricia Maldonado, do you want to ask your, uh, unmute and ask your question or do you want me to ask your question? Okay, so I'll ask her a question. Um, is eight hours of sleep the goal? I find myself more rested when I get a little more like nine or 10, um, but it could also mean that I'm not getting enough deep sleep. Yeah, this is, a, this, this is a great question because um, there's a lot of pressure, I think sometimes by headlines about getting eight hours of sleep. And the, the recommendation for adults 18 to 64 is seven to nine hours. So the reason why everyone talks about eight is because I think it's eight is right in the middle of seven and nine. Um, but what we really need to understand is that our sleep needs are individual. So um, it's like a shoe size, right? So we don't all have the same size shoe. We're not going to all have the same amount of sleep that we need. So we really need to figure out what, what is best for us and then try to honor that. Some people need, you know, a little, a little more than eight hours of sleep. Some people need nine. Um, some people do just great with a little under seven, but when you're getting below like six, you're, it's kind of a slippery slope and so a lot have, of people. So we have tons of questions. So one last question, yeah. what are your thoughts on nap? So Anne has this question, good or bad idea. I feel like I really need sleep on the weekend to catch up. What are your thoughts on naps? I think naps are a good practice. Um, if you're going to take a nap, I would advise taking a short nap, 20, 30 minutes. If you go much longer than that, you might experience something called sleep inertia. That's when you wake up from a nap. I think we've all experienced this when you're really groggy or irritable. What you, what's happened is you have gone into a deeper phase of sleep and you've been woken up. So you want to take the nap for a short period of time so that you're not getting into a deep phase of sleep. Um, naps in early afternoon have been shown to um, help memory, um, encourage learning, creativity. So I think they're great, but you want to, I think it's probably better for most people to use it as an, for, like an, an as needed basis. So for example, if you have a sleep debt and we all experience sleep debt from time to time, even if we're really, really conscientious about our sleep, we may want to go to a concert and we're just, you know, we want to live our lives. We want to have it fun and enjoy people. So we need to accept the fact that there's some nights we're just not going to get the amount of sleep we need. And one thing we can do to, to make the next day easier is to catch a, a small, like a short nap. Awesome. Um, yeah. So last question, how can we help you? How can we find you? Uh, is the best way to find you on LinkedIn? Tell us where to find you, your website URL, how we can support you, et cetera. I'm everywhere. No, <laughs> I feel like I'm everywhere. I am on LinkedIn, quite active on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram as well. And my website is morganadamswellness.com. I offer a free mini course that I just developed called the Sleep Reset Solution. And I also offer complimentary sleep clarity calls for anyone who is struggling and wants um, to talk about potential, potentially working together. So I'd love to chat with anyone who has lingering questions or concerns. I love talking about this. I love that. Thank you so much. So everyone, you know the deal. Go into, uh, if you're in the live Zoom audience, go into gallery mode, unmute yourself. This is the only time I ask you if you can unmute yourself and also turn on your videos and let's give Morgan a round of applause. Woo -hoo! Thank, Thank you, you, Morgan. Thank that you was so, so much. great. And I hope we get, I think we're all going to get better sleep because of you. Um, but thank you so much for everyone on this call. Make sure you support Morgan on uh, on her uh, LinkedIn and all of her social pages. And uh, 
see you all at the next talk and make sure you sign up to our um li our youtube channel that we just launched and we'll be playing this replaying this video uh probably in a few weeks or uh, when we edit and upload okay thanks everyone thanks morgan Bye.